Step-by-Step Systematic Cane Instruction Workshop, December 9, 2021, Donna Sauerberger and Rebecca Sheffield. Links and information for getting ACVRP credit are at www.sauerberger.org forward slash cane workshop. All right. Well, good evening or good early, late afternoon, depending on <laughs> what, what time zone you're in. But um, no, definitely welcome. I'm so excited to see so many folks here today. And um, you, if, if you came for a step-by-step systematic cane instruction, then you are on board the right flight. So we um, are, are glad that you're here. My name is Rebecca Sheffield. I am an intern at the intern stage of um, being an orientation and mobility student at Portland State University. I'm also an education program specialist at the US Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs. So that means I get to be project officer for some of the cool stuff in our field like the National Instructional Materials Accessibility Center, state deaf blind projects and personal prep grants in our field. but. By far, one of the coolest things I've done this year is working with um, Donna Sauerberger. So, so um, she needs no introduction, but I will introduce her anyway. And um, it also happens to be her birthday for those who who, do, who don't know or weren't on the call earlier. So I'll share that. So happy birthday, Donna. Thank you. And <laughs> Donna is a certified orientation mobility specialist. Um, we, as we know, she has an extensive history of service, leadership, and advocacy in our field. Um, I got to take cane class with her, which was fantastic this summer. And um, specific to today's presentation, Donna um, is co-author with Dr. Jean Borkin on a 2010 publication titled um, "Teaching the Use of Cane Step by Step." And so that's that was published in JVIB in 2010. Um, so other important information for your um, for your um, participation today, you should know that we are recording, but anything that, um, you know, we will share the recording with those who are in attendance first, and then you'll be able to email Donna and let her know if anything that you wouldn't want um, contained in the public recording before it goes to a broader audience. So we have a notes document, so I'll put that in the chat. It's the same thing that you um, that you received as an attachment to the invitation. So when we're taking notes later as a group, and I'll be typing in the notes document, if you want to follow along, you won't be able to edit that version of the document, but you can follow along or we'll be sharing on the screen. So you'll be able to do that, see that. Um, I will show the agenda here. Um, so it's 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 not a super complicated agenda, but we are going to have some pretty in-depth discussions, beginning with motivation, moving into um, a discussion of stages of learning the cane, um, principles of instruction. Then we'll take time to process what we learned, breakout room through breakout breakout room discussions, some time to brainstorm on your own, and as well as sharing insights. And then we'll wrap up with a more even more interactive opportunity to, to brainstorm as a group ideas about teaching specific cane skills. All right, and I'm going to switch my screen over to, um, to a notes document that has some information, but, but mostly um, this, is, this, this will be um, Donna giving us uh, some background and, and leading a discussion on motivation. I think we're ready, Donna. All right, very good. So I'm gonna to start today with uh, a discussion on motivation. And there, um, this is, a lot of this is based on, um, my son Stefan was a uh, game designer. And as such, he learned a lot about how they motivate us to play games. And not that I know anything about this, about being addicted to games. I. I happen to be on level 2,134 on Candy Crush, but it's not because I'm addicted, it's just because it's a productive use of my time. Anyway, he, ha he has shared with us and, and then did this in several workshops uh, for AER conferences, some of the principles that they use in designing their, their workshops. Before we go into those um, 
characteristics, which we can apply to what we're teaching. I'm gonna cover two things that um, he has shared with me. One of which is kind of obvious. <laughs> and that is that um, we need to make sure that in order for our students to be motivated, that they are, um, a, a it is helping them to achieve some goal that they have, some emotional need. And uh, he, when, one of the workshops that he did, he um, asked um, for um, you know, people to, to participate. And one of them was a mobility instructor whose student, and he asked, what is, what is motivating your student? What is your student's emotional goal? And, he, and she said, well, he wants to be a musician. And so tried to work with her on how to connect what she was teaching with his goal, with his emotional needs, to meet his needs. And um, so uh, she ended up thinking about how is he going to get to his gigs? How is he going to do things um, if he's not going to be, you know, he needs to have these skills in order to meet his needs. I'm putting a, a poll out um, and if I'd, I'd like to, um, to see what you think about how important motivation is. If anybody has trouble getting onto it, all but six of you has filled it out, all but four. And uh, three of you thought it's easier to teach somebody who's not motivated than it is to teach somebody who is um, motivated. I would love to talk with you guys to see how, it is, how that's easier, whether you just read the question wrong. Um, the rest of you said it's either more challenging or it's much more challenging and, and sometimes impossible. So um, I think that's, but that's been my experience is that it's really hard to teach anything um, if, if the student's not motivated to learn it. I mean, I, I had this one student who, um, um, she was a young woman, um, in about 20 or 19, and we worked on her with a cane and it took her forever and we never did really succeed. So finally I said, you know, she had a lot of vision. And so I said, it's just not working, I'm sorry. And I, I, I didn't know what else to do. It just wasn't working, I was doing my best. And she came back a couple of years later and lost some vision and said, she'd like to learn to use a cane. I said, well, you know, we tried that when you said you were motivated, um, tried again. And she learned it in a couple of hours. She learned it very quickly. And I learned something right there. If someone's motivated, like they're gonna actually use it, they're gonna learn it then when they're not motivated. So, so that's pretty obvious um, about motivating somebody by need, connecting with an emotional need that they have. And we're gonna have another poll here. This one asks, um, if you have taught for more than two years, have you ever motivated your learner with rewards or points or favors or money, et cetera? All right. Well, most of you um, are like me, that we, I, you've occasionally done it. The only way I remember that I did it is that I was, there was a 10 year old child and he had kept walking with his head down, totally blind. And, and so I, I started giving him little prizes if he would hold his head up for 10 seconds, a little, give him a little, I made little paper coupons and, and I, I would stick them in his pocket as he's walking. You know, if it was 10 seconds of head up, then um, I stick a little paper in there. And the only reason I remember it, because this was so many years ago, um, is that when we got to the end of the block, there's this little blind kid, you know, using his cane and this lady stuffing paper into his pocket. At the corner, the guy, some of the guys there said, um, excuse me, ma'am, we, we, you know, haven't eaten in several days. Could you spare us a dime? You know, they thought I was, and that's the only reason it sticks out in my mind. So I know I've done it too. Well, let me tell you that ex that's extrinsic motivation. There's two kinds of motivation. The motivation that comes from you, that's something you uh, want to do for yourself to meet your needs. And then there's extrinsic motivation. You're doing it for a salary. You're doing it for points. You're doing it to please your instructor. You're doing it to whatever. <laughs> and so some studies were done. This is in your handout. Um, uh, the, the link I gave in the handout is a summary of research, more than 100, I think it's 116 um, different uh, studies that were done that showed that one of the studies was the children came, were, were in a room and giving all kinds of puzzles and, and whatever, um, tinker toys and things like that. And, and they watched, measured how much they played with, with each one. 
Then they started rewarding them for, you know, I'll pay you a nickel or a quarter, whatever it was for completing this puzzle or putting this tinker toy together or whatever it was. And boy, the activity went up, you know, and they were putting it together and whatever. And then this, then the re- extrinsic motivation stopped. They stopped rewarding them. And then they watched. A lot of the students never touched them again. Whatever intrinsic motivation they had for those, whatever pleasure it gave them, whatever interest they had, whatever needs that were being met, they stopped. So you take a risk when you motivate a student by rewarding them, trying to get them to do something to get a reward or to please you or whatever, because it will um, possibly backfire and they will lose whatever interest they had. So it's more um, helpful to hook into something that is intrinsically motivating to them. Any questions on that? All right, we're gonna go through a list of some of the uh, factors that um, Stefan had said are built into these addictive games to make us intrinsically motivated to do them. And I thought I'm gonna go through them real quickly. And then when we go through the stages of learning the cane and how to teach, um, we're gonna try, we're gonna go back to this list and see how we can alter, what we can do in our instruction to provide some of these factors, some of these characteristics. The first one is goal clarity. Um, So, and he says that opens the road, you know, if, if it's real clear what the goal is, Um, And he has you list three concrete measurable benefits connected with their um, strong emotional need, which your which your student will receive immediately upon starting to work with you. So some goal, some clear goal as to what is going to happen. The second one is a guarantee of a chance. And some of these I found fascinating. They're not guaranteed success, but guaranteeing a chance. can, when your student starts to work with you, can he or she clearly anticipate what comes next? Um, what is he unsure about? What risk does your consumer perceive in moving forward, et cetera? What sort of guarantee that you haven't offered until now would cause him or her to gain from your training, no matter what the outcome is? And how, are she, how would she or he express it? Another one is that the learner has agency. So um, how can you make the major steps of your program the result of your student's personal choice. So we're gonna be thinking about that when we, when we talk about some of the um, uh, teaching. Um, and what are some choices that you can offer your student that will allow the student uh, perhaps to have that become an expression of her, himself or herself. All right, next um, factor is, um, Limitation of action. And I thought this was strange, but actually research has shown, like if you, they, they put um, maybe three products on a shelf in a store and they see how many, how this, the customers pick among them. And then they put like 20 choices. And a lot of the customers would take a look at all those choices and they would just leave. It was too much. It was overwhelming. There was too much risk. I think they said that you might make the wrong choice. And so rather than take that risk, they'll just back off. So keep the number of, of options uh, limited so that they are not paralyzed <laughs> with being overwhelmed with all the choices. Um, obstacles in the game or in your training, they should be challenging, but surmountable and interesting and enjoyable. And so how you, can you make each of the obstacles uh, into an interesting challenge for you folks to, to work together with? Tangible display of project progress. This kind of blew my mind. Jack, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, as far as the limitation of action, is that particularly in like what goals you're set, the, the student is setting or in what you're going to teach? In choices. It's in choices, giving your student choices. So if you give your student 30 choices, it's like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> you give your student three choices. Oh, okay. I can handle that. Let's look at the advantages of each one and they pick one. But if it's too many choices, um, no, I don't think, I don't know that you have- I guess choices of what? Whatever. Okay. Yeah. Whenever you're offering choices, keep it manageable. Okay. (laughs) Overwhelm them with choices. Make sense? Yes. Thanks. All right. Very good. 
Um, the other one, this one kind of surprised me. And when I thought about it, I thought, oh, so clear, a tangible display of progress. Now, you know, when you're playing a game, you, um, you know, you have some kind of level that you're on or whatever. And when you're doing fundraising, a lot of times you'll see that thermometer and you can see right where the progress is in a very tangible, clear way as to how far you are towards your, your goal. And, um, and it's more than great job, you're just doing great, but some tangible mark, he calls it like um, maybe having a uh, progress bar, something, something that would have your student really understand very concretely exactly where they are in their progress. Another one is um, sense of mastery. And I had trouble under, you know, distinguishing this from, from a sense of accomplishment, but a sense of mastery means something that you are skilled at or you recognize that you're skilled at. Um, and you can take some of these skills um, and think about which one of those maybe might have direct, um, if they're skilled in something, how might that be fed into what you're working on so that they can use a, something that they're skilled at, that they have a sense of mastery as they're learning this new thing that they, they um, are not feeling totally overwhelmed. The sense of accomplishment is more that I've done something. You know, it says, how, do you, how does your student typically feel right after they've worked with you? Is it like, oh, okay, I got that one. I got that task over with. Um, or is it that they've accomplished something, that they've um, done something meaningful that, uh, to their life, et cetera. And that's it for the motivation. Any, any ideas, any suggestions before we move on? All right. Well, then I am going to go into the stages of learning the cane. And here's where Rebecca is going to be our note taker. And we're going to fill in the outline here. So the first stage in learning a skill, especially a physical skill like this, is, what's my page here, is the beginner stage. And so we're going to you know, the beginner is somebody who's just learning. They, um, they don't know what to do. So what would this kind of a student look like? What, and what could you expect from them? How would you know, oh, this student's a beginner. What would they be showing or doing? Jack, oh. and then Catherine. Go for um, it. So probably focusing a lot on just getting the cane back and forth and yeah. on and having a really irregular arc or really yeah. irregular rhythm. Um, wow. Because every yeah. time they stop thinking about one thing, they lose it. <laughs> Wonderful. So their cane technique is not reliable. Sometimes the arc, you said the arc goes off or they're out of rhythm or whatever. Excellent, excellent. Catherine, did you have something that you wanted to? I think oftentimes what I notice is students are checking in, like, is this right? Is this it? Is this, is this what it should look like? You know, they're, they're really checking in um, as they, they're, they're quite self-conscious, uh, con conscious of the awkwardness. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, right. Michael? I was just going to say that the aha effect often happens when a person is first got a cane in their hand, like, oh, that cane just found that post. And I would have run into it otherwise. And so they're learning what the purpose of the cane is. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. At this stage, they don't may not may not even know what the purpose of the cane is. And then they're they're finding out. Leah. Maybe they're still learning the different cane grips as well and where to position the cane. Right, right, exactly. All right. So in other words, they're still learning. I think one of you said that they're looking for, uh, to us for feedback. They need, they need our, you know, is this right? Is this right? Am I doing it right? They don't know how to do it, right? Excellent. Rebecca, how you doing? Got, Got it. it. Yeah. All right. All right. So we kind of talked a little bit about expectations. Uh, we, what could we expect from them? What could we not expect from them? And I think some of you had already said, um, yeah, we're not going to expect um, uh, um, proficient cane, reliable cane skills yet, right? 
right. Yeah. Um, some of you had said there, there might be irregular um, rhythm. You know, in other words, they're not doing it right, reliably. Can I, oh, sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Yes. <laughs> I apologize. But I was going to say that I, I noticed that sometimes students tend to focus on one aspect of the technique, right? And then not, you know, not the, the comprehensive whole. So they, they'll find uh, whether it's their hand centering or their arc and their hand is to the side or they're not walking in step. So it's, they usually pick a piece, right? Yeah. One yeah. little piece at a time. Exactly, exactly. Um, wow. We, some of you have gone into the next part, which is to progress to the next stage, the student needs, and one of you had already said, needs feedback, needs um, critique, right? Um, and Kat, uh, was it Catherine who just spoke, uh, who said um, they need to focus on one thing at a time sometimes? Oh, and um, Kylie. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. Um, I was going to say not going to uh, feedback and critiques, but back to expectation. But the student's going to be apprehensive with the cane, like they're not going to trust it yet. And then also when they find obstacles, they're they're going to be um, kind of jarred by it or scared, yeah. you know. So it's like those apprehensive fears where they like first get the cane, and then they have that oh aha, aha moment but it like takes some time. Yeah, oh, beautiful, Kylie, beautiful. All right, so um, feel free to chip anything in on the past, but we're, um, in, and we're working now on um, uh, what, do, what do they need? Jack, were you gonna? Uh, no, I was just gonna say that they don't really have a sense of where the tip of the cane is. Mm, beautiful. That's something I've been running into a lot recently where you know, because their hand position is moving so much that they don't really have a sense of whether the cane is in front of them or off to the side of them or, and I just had somebody walk past their cane and tumble down the stairs. Eek. Okay. Like, and I, I even saw it on video and she had the cane out to one side and, yeah. you know, she just walked right past her hand. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Gee, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, and that can go to our expectations too, right? That we cannot at this stage expect them to reliably be safe uh, travelers. Yes, <laughs> to, 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 to determine that there's a stair there. Yeah, we cannot expect that of them. Wonderful. Now, what, to, what do they need? Um, let me ask you something. Can they learn cane skills? why you're asking them to do something else. Like maybe, maybe they're in a residential area and you're having them listen to the cars. Can they listen to the cars as you ask them at the same time that you're teaching or they're learning something about the cane? Catherine, did you wanna answer that or are you gonna add something else? No, sorry, yeah, no, I was gonna answer that. No, I think they can't be distracted by anything else. They need to be singly focused because they're just mm -hmm learning how to move the cane and pay attention to the cane itself. So no. Yeah. Does anyone disagree that, that, uh, that, you know, they could, you could, you could teach someone to learn the cane at the same time that you're having them pay attention or do something else. No disagreements. Yeah. Kath Catherine, I agree. Um, you know, if they haven't yet learned the cane uh, skills, and I'm trying to teach them something, something, whatever else, you know, maybe orienting to the building or, or something. I tell them, we're not gonna work on your cane right now. I'm not gonna give you feedback on the cane because that's not what the focus is right now. And so when we're working on the cane, we're working on the cane. We're not distracting them with something else. Wonderful. Okay. Um, Anything else about uh, what they need from us besides feedback and opportunities to concentrate on it? I think I just might add that I just had this experience today, in fact, that I have a new uh, learner just learning the cane and it kind of ties into your motivation and um, that, that personal um, buy-in because in the midst of 
where we were, the student wanted to redirect the attention to learn something about the environment of this retaining wall that was running alongside his driveway. And so that became the shift in the focus because he was more motivated to understand and sort of mind map where he was in relation to his house that we in fact put the instructional component of learning the cane to the side so that he could, um, so I, I was just kind of tying that into what you were talking about regarding um, motivation. Sometimes I do allow the student to express a personal choice about, in a context of something, um, but I wouldn't try and push both at the same time. Oh, Catherine, that is such a beautiful example. A, a teaching moment comes up, doesn't it? And, and your lesson for the day is the cane, or for the moment is the cane, but you realize you have a teachable moment there, and so you can't really expect them to learn the cane at the same time you're teaching them something else. Um, and Jack, you had put something in the chat. I'm not really watching the chat, but it popped up in my head. And so could you share that? It looked like a really good point. Sure, I would just, how much would you, if you were going to work on something else while they are still in the beginning stages, would you let them know, okay, so, you know, I'm going to be monitoring for safety while we're doing this because, and also how would you put that so it's not putting them down saying, because your cane skills aren't really up to snuff, I'm going to be monitoring for safety. Um, well, what would be a way that you would say that? That's such a beautiful, anybody have, have ideas? How would you say that to a student? And, and is there anything wrong with saying it that way? Because your cane skills are not yet protecting you and we're working on something else, I'm going to protect you. Is there anything wrong? I'm not going to focus on the cane skills right now. Yes, yes. And I'm going to provide. I, what I really like what you brought up is that you let them know that cane is not protecting them right now. Um, they're still learning to use it and that you will protect them. And so that they can go about and safely feel safe while they're exploring or whatever, looking at the curb or whatever Catherine was doing, um, knowing that the focus is not on the cane. And yet they're safe because you are there and that they understand the cane at this point is not giving them any safety protection. Does anybody have any ideas about how to say that or, or is there anything wrong with saying what the way that Jack said it? I can tell you what I said today. Yes. yes. I don't want to dominate, sorry. <laughs> I love it, oh, jump in. Um, but what I said today was, let's look at this as a team. We'll put the we'll put the cane aside so that we can focus on what's really interesting to you right now. Because it was a useful bit of information, very relevant to, um, you know. So I just said, let's explore this as a team, and we'll go together, human guide. So that's kind of how I addressed it, and he was happy to, you know, lift the that showed him how to hold his cane in that sort of rest position. Yeah. And let's just explore this as a team. So you never said, I will protect you, but you offered. I didn't, yeah, I didn't use that language. I, yeah, but when you, we, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Go, go ahead. ahead. Well, you, 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 you offered him protection. You provide, let me, you didn't offer, you provided protection. You offered a way for him to explore while, while holding your arm. And that kind of implies safety. So you never had to say, look, honey, you're not safe right now with that cane let me protect you, but you just, you just did it, huh? Right. And I, so I, I was the substitutionary cane. <laughs> right. You were the, what is it? The, uh, mo the, what is it called? You were the uh, mobility tool for the moment. Yeah, there you go. Right. Any other ideas on that? Jack has such a beautiful point. Angela and Chris have a hand oh, raised. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yep. And then Eliza. Mm -hmm. I was just going to share that um, just letting them know that uh, it's at this stage of their learning, it's difficult for them to be doing two things at once. So if they're focusing on their orientation, their cane skills are likely going to deteriorate. And so that they're aware of the process, just like if you compliment them, that's probably the same time they'll be out of step because we've distracted them. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Eliza. Yeah. Um... It just it depends too on the, the individual person. Uh, like if it's a very nervous person, I, I do let them know up front, you know, hey, I'm gonna give you forewarning if you're gonna come up to any sort of hazard in the environment. 
Um, but if they're kind of gun ho and explorative, um, I'll definitely be monitoring them, but more maybe um, in a guidance sort of way and not, not so upfront because they're, they're kind of excited and yeah. off and going and <laughs> I don't know. So kind of gauging um, the individual and um, what information, you know, um, would be, you know, beneficial for them in, in, in traveling in that environment. Oh, very good, uh, Eliza. Amy and then Watts, uh, Lori, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next section. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, this is Amy. As the same thing, I'll tell um, the student or client to trust. You know, you're working on trusting your cane and reacting to your cane's information. So I'll use that kind of terminology of trusting the cane. But the same thing, you know, we, you know, I don't have all the answers. Uh, we're, we're working as a team. It's my job to keep you safe. So I'm gonna keep mm -hmm. you safe as you start to I trust your cane consistently. Right. And at this point, can they trust their cane? Can they, does the cane provide them the protect? No. Right. So they need to know at this point, it's not really providing you, but it will. You can trust that it will. And Lori, what, let's. Um, when we talk about letting the student know that the cane is not going to protect them right now, but they're safe because you're there. Sometimes they think they're safe because of um, their vision. Mm. And I also need to point out that that may not be reliable either. Wonderful, wonderful. And boy, that's a whole thing to work with, isn't it? Um, learning to, to when it's uh, reliable and when it's not. Jeannie, I wanted to move on to the next one. Did you, um, why don't we go, go ahead and say something and then we're going to go to the next. Okay, just uh, real quick. I just was going to say like today I was telling a student you know, she wasn't reacting to the cane, finding something in an unfamiliar location. And I was letting her know, like, you know, it's okay to take your time. Cause I think often, like sometimes they're trying to please us. So letting them know like, Hey, if you find something like, you know, it's okay to stop or slow down and like, let's figure this out. So um, I just wanted to add that. Wow. Nice. Nice. I'm glad, glad you got a chance to speak up. All right. Um, so we know what the student looks like. We know what, you know, how to assess that this is a beginner <laughs> because it has these characteristics. They're not consistent. They don't, they're looking for our feedback. We know what they need. They need our feedback. They need to be able to concentrate on it. And they need to be, when they're doing something else, they need our protection. They need, um, they're not fully protected yet. Um, principles of teaching. I thought I'd go over some of these. Um, this is based on, uh, you know, research that Jean, uh, Dr. Borkwin um, found for our article. And I found it most helpful. And for me, it was most enlightening. I, I, I knew nothing about this. Um, for, first of all, of course, appropriate feedback. Uh, studies have indicated that if you, the feedback is consistent and, and continuous, they learn less than when the feedback is um, less continuous. And, um, of course, it's a good idea to start with a lot of feedback in the beginning. One of you had said how they're looking for to us for feedback. How is this? Is this right? And whatever. And then backing off as as it uh, as it would be appropriate. The second, the the other thing that surprised me a lot was um, that if you have like a certain amount of time, six, let's say you're going to work for sixty minutes on a on a on learning a skill, if you spend sixty minutes solid you're not gonna learn nearly as much as if you take those uh, 60 minutes into 10 minute segments, separated by at least 10 minutes to six hours. Um, when you separate them, um, it creates the first stabilizing, stabilization phase of the consol consolidation so that they're learning, they're, they're pulling it in, they're learning um, to have uh, you know, this in, in their brain. Um, and also if, those sessions are separated by sleep. That's where they can uh, process it and improve their speed and accuracy. So it's not a good idea to, all right, today we're gonna learn the cane and tomorrow we're gonna work on the next something else. But you intersperse these, cane, these lessons with the cane with other things. And there's another, one more principle when you're doing that, it's the interference of skills. So that if you're teaching one thing, like for example, maybe, um, hand position. And then uh, they, they've got that. And so now you're working on being able to work, you know, 
in, in um, rhythm with, with their feet. And um, what happens if, if, especially if the one skill is similar to the first skill, is that at the end of the day, what they'll have, what they'll remember, what they'll process, what they'll keep for the next lesson is the last skill they learned. They won't necessarily learn the first one. And one of you had talked about singling out, you know, the students like to single out and focus on one thing at a time. And I do as well. Um, and I find that they may learn, for example, great hand position and their arms moving, you know, holding still and everything's just right. And then I ask them to walk and now the, case, the hand is everywhere. Um, and so what I do is I just, um, well, what would you do if that was the case? You've, you've, they've learned one thing, you've moved on to the next and they're not, and the first one that you learned, you taught them is now not, work, not working. What, what would you do? Catherine's hand is up. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm so <laughs> freaked out. My computer went off that I, I didn't notice. Catherine, what's, what, what would you do? I would isolate the skill. Hmm. That's what I would do. I would no. isolate the skill and allow that uh, student some time to, to practice and, 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 you know, regain that confidence to sort of maintain that particular skill. So I would isolate it. Great. And if, for example, the, the skill he just learned was holding the cane and moving it back and forth, and the skill that you're working on now is uh, walking in rhythm, would it, does it matter which one you isolate, which one you work on first? Does it have to be in some order or does it not matter? Is that for, for me or for anybody? Yeah, for, for you. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> um, I think it, I have to think about that. I, I think that it, it makes sense to me that, um, no, I don't know. I, I think it just depends on what the, what the student is gravitating toward and how the, whatever is bringing fluidity to the movement. Yeah. So I, that's, I think, how I would approach it. I, I don't necessarily have a rigid pattern of, yeah. uh, if I know that they can demonstrate those things in context, like if they can demonstrate in isolation, um, how to maintain the, the grip or your hand at, the, at midline and they can demonstrate an appropriate arc and they can do those things in isolation. I think it, it comes in time. So, yes. yeah, so I, yeah. Okay, so it, there's no uh, prerequisites. One's not a prerequisite for the other. You can work on either one. Jack, did you, did you have ideas for this? Yep, so splitting the components up, do you ever run into them essentially building a bad habit mm. because you focused on one part of it and let them do the rest of it however they're gonna do it, then do they get used to having their hand way out to the side or moving their arm back and forth, moving the cane back and forth with their whole arm or, um, Swing, sweeping the cane about yeah. once every five yeah. steps. All right, we got some hands up. Let's see, Eliza, what do you think? Uh, well, if they've mastered that first skill of keeping their hand centered, um, and then they begin working on being in rhythm with their cane, um, and that hand, hand just kind of goes a wire. Um, uh, my thought, and I love other people's opinion on that, it was just to kind of let let that go because now you're working on being in rhythm. And as you said, if they've mastered the hand centered, you know they can they demonstrate the ability to do it. So if you end with the in rhythm um, practice and such, that's what they're gonna kind of um, process that throughout the rest of the day. And you know, when you come back the next day, you kind of review each one maybe in that same order and see how they're going. And then if they seem to progress with the in uh, with the rhythm, try and then okay, well let's now kind of put them together, yeah. you know, kind of building blocks. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, my experience has been the same as, as many of you have said that, uh, you know, Jack, they don't, they don't lose it. I, we don't work on it that long that they develop a habit. It's just that they're not paying attention to their hand now. And so we work on the rhythm until we get that. For, from, I find that to be the hardest is to get the rhythm and be in step. And so if they had their hand, and now we're working on if finally get them into rhythm. They say, 
right, you've got the rhythm. Now let's go back and see if you can do that with your hand. And so we'll, fo we'll change the focus. Um, and if they lose the other one, then we'll go back again, back and forth. All right, so let's go through our, our motivation considerations and see how we can fit, use these to, to enhance our teaching and enhance their motivation. Um, giving the learner agency, any ideas on when they're at the beginning stage and you're teaching them, um, how you can give them agency as to what, what you know, into the planning of their program. Any ideas? Can you remind me again what you mean by agency? Yes, um, that instead of, all right, Shirley, today we're going to do this and that and the other. Yes, ma'am. But giving them um, some control over what's being taught and how it's being taught. No ideas. Or is it just so simple you're thinking, come on. Uh, really this is Amy. Um, I would say um, to ask them, you know, how do you feel you're doing on this skill? You want to, <laughs> like, where do you want to start today? You know, I have three things in mind, but you tell me where you want to start. So I think getting their voice or like having their voice yeah. be expressed. Wonderful, Amy. Thank you. There's a lot that we can be teaching at this stage, right? Um, you know, the, the centering the hand, the rhythm, and, and even, you know, interspersing it with other, other things. Maybe you don't work on the cane today. Beautiful, Amy. And they have some choice, some agency. Beautiful. Any way that we could um, um, have the obstacle or the, uh, you know, what they're learning to be challenging, but enjoyable and surmountable. And this might be just too obvious. I don't know if we need to even say anything that basically you have to keep your, you know, if something, if someone's overwhelmed with a task, maybe what would they, what would you do if somebody was just the, the task, the obstacle that they're trying to learn is so overwhelming, what might you do? Break it down into smaller chunks. Break it down. Yeah. Beautiful. Great. Now, the tangible uh, determination of progress, some kind of progress bar. Any ideas how you might do that in the general scheme of teaching the cane? We could say, um, okay, how did you feel on a scale from one to 10? So they can always kind of self-monitor maybe, or you know, one to five. I, I love that for, for getting some feedback as to how they're doing. Um, but a progress bar would be something that goes, that measures their progress. Um, and so, Danielle. So this might be a silly idea, but um, I just was thinking about a progress bar and how it's very convenient, the, the shape of the cane. And so if you could use the cane as a progress bar in some way where um, maybe when it's a beginner stage, the handle or just below the handle, you can make some marking of some kind uh, so that they can actually see the progression. And so once they really advance their skills, they get all the way down to the bottom of the cane to their tip. I don't know, it might be a silly idea. That's beautiful. So you're using the stages, the four stages of learning the cane? I don't and know, yeah, it was just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when Stefan first told me about this needing to have you know, some kind of measure of progress, some kind of tangible understanding of progress. That's the first thing I thought was, was the four stages of learning the cane um, because it's such a concrete, you know, you're in this stage or, you know, oh, you're, you're almost up to the second stage. You might be between the first and the second stage or, oh, you're concentrating. So now you're on the second stage. Let's see if we can get you to the third stage. And so um, I, I find it as very, very, um, motivating for people to to know what stage they're in. That's a brilliant idea, Daniel. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, and you you talked about uh, measuring it on a cane. What a cool idea! You know, wh when he said that it has to be a tangible measure of progress, he didn't really mean physically. You know, <laughs> that, that you could hold it or you know feel the mark. Um, it's just an understanding that you know. He, where the goal is and how far along you are. And so it could be just explaining it, having them understand what stage they're in. 
but I love your idea of a cane, something that they're familiar with. Convenient that so many of our canes are four sections. <laughs> yeah. Four stages, four sections. So you could like have the cane all marked out, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and each section is a different uh, thing. And you could kind of mark how far along you're getting on each stage. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and I think, you know, you're getting the idea that um, having them understand how far they are in the progress towards, towards their goal is so um, motivating. And that's a great way to do it. So, all right. So now uh, we're in uh, the concentration is the second stage. And that's when they can uh, do it themselves, but only when they're concentrating on it. So what would, uh, what would your student look like who are in this stage? Um, what can you expect of them you know, when they're in concentration stage? And um, how can you know that they're in this stage, the second stage where they can do it? but only when concentrating. Jack, were you Ask raising- Ask them a quick question, sorry. <laughs> Ask them a question? And see if they lose their technique. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's actually a good test for the next stage when they don't need to concentrate. At this stage, they can do it well without feedback, but they need to concentrate on it. So I love it, Catherine. That's a great way to test have they gone up to the next stage because if, they, if they're doing it, I used to say, it was a couple of years where I would say, wow, you're doing such a great job because they just walked down the entire hall perfectly. And that's right when they happened to go off. And I'm thinking, dang, if I just waited a little bit, then I wouldn't have. Been. And then finally I put two, two together and I thought, no, they went off because I distracted them. So wonderful, Catherine. So that's a great um, uh, test to see if they if they're still in this stage where they need to be able to concentrate. I sometimes ask them if they're doing really well. Hey, what are you having for dinner? What what did you think about that show the other day? And watch what happens. Beautiful. What what can we expect of a student in this stage? Do they still need our feedback if they can do it um, as long as they concentrate? Yeah, I think that when they uh, would start to self-reflect themselves and say, oh, I'm out of step or, oh, so they kind of recognize if they're not doing something correct. Yes, yes. Catherine, what do you think? Right, I was just going to say the same thing. That, you mm -hmm. know, they, they don't need any prompting. They can, they and then they can self-monitor. Yeah, if they needed prompting, what stage would they be in? One, yeah, <laughs> one. In one, that's right. They'd be a beginner. They still need prompting. If they don't need, if they don't need prompting um, at this stage, they don't need prompting. They just need to concentrate. If we distract them, the cane goes off. That's how we know we're in that stage. They're in that stage. Great. Now, um, so what do they need from us to get to the next stage? Or what do they need in general? Maybe not from us, but in general. How do they get to the next stage? Practice. Practice, exactly. Practice. Can they practice by walking a mile with the cane? Could they concentrate for 20 minutes on the cane? <laughs> I see the smoke coming out of your head. What does anybody think? Can, how long can somebody concentrate on the cane before their mind starts to wander and like, oh, well, that's interesting over there. What's going on over there? Would you have them like say, you know, I'd like you to focus on the cane when you're walking from you know, the door of your, your apartment to a particular place, you know, half a block away, where they don't need to do anything other than, yeah. I love it. And, and some place that they're familiar, right? You're the, mm -hmm. yeah. they, know. they don't have to like, where am I? Oh my gosh. So just a half a block, a very segmented short time and concentrate on it. Wonderful. Any other ideas? 
anybody agree with that or think, no, nah, that's, yeah. In general, people can concentrate on something for usually less than a minute <laughs> before their mind starts to wander. You know, those of us who meditate, it takes a few seconds and, and we're off, you know, <laughs> thinking about something else. So um, I sometimes say 30 seconds, no more, maybe a minute if you're stretching it, but it's really, you're really, ex uh, for somebody to, to concentrate from, for a minute is very exceptional. So I'll have them uh, do like Jack suggested and have them, and I, I ask them to do it several times a day, several times a day, find a place that like Jack said, where you're comfortable, where you don't have to, you know, figure out where you are, whatever, and concentrate only on the cane, just for a short period, do it three or four times in that setting, you know, stop, think about whatever you're going to think about. Okay, here we go. Concentrate, finish. Oh yeah. Well, that was such a cool story. Oh, time to go. Concentrate just 30 seconds, 20 seconds, and then um, do that a couple times a day. They really don't need us at this point. They can concentrate as long as they're in a safe place. And like Jack said, where they don't have to think about something else and just practice, practice, practice. That's all that they need at this point. An ideal place to practice would be in a long hallway. Okay. Uh, so what else do we have here? Stage three, consolidation. This is the stage where they can do it even when they're not concentrating. So how do we know that they're in that stage? What do they look like? What do they do? Oh, Catherine, and then Angela and Chris. <laughs> I think it's just a natural part of their walking. They've got a rhythm and they're just in a- Just right doing there. it. Yeah, they're just doing it. They're yeah. just doing it. Um, very good. Uh, uh, Angela and Chris. At, at this point, they're probably also doing some self-correction and they're demonstrating that they're self-monitoring. So if they're out of step, they're going to correct it. Beautiful, beautiful. And if um, somebody asks a question or, or something like that, what happens then? Do they it's lose maintained. it? No. They maintain. Exactly. They maintain. Um, Chris and Greg uh, learned this, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, Rebecca and Greg uh, learned this um, when I was teaching them and I gave them that assignment. And then when they came back, we were gonna start on residential tra uh, travel. And I said, uh, let me, let me see, walk across the parking lot here. Let's see how, how well you did. And unbeknownst to them, as they're walking, oh, was it a hard trip? Did, you know, how was it hard? You know, so I'm asking them questions and I'm watching their cane and both times, it, they just answered the question and then, and the cane was still going. And that's how I knew, oh my gosh, you're in stage three. You have achieved it. Fantastic. All right. Um, so um, what does the student need to progress to the next stage? The next stage is where I've seen a lot of students who can move their cane. It's part of them. They can think about anything they want. It drops over an edge that they, that looked flat or they expected it to be flat and they ignore that cane drop. So um, what do they need to do? The fourth stage is when they notice that. So what do we need to do to get them to that fourth stage? So would that also be part of the stage three assessment that they can maintain it, but they don't always pay attention to it? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So, oh, you're still in the third stage. You're not up there yet. Excellent, Jack. Thank you. I forgot to talk about assessing what stage they're in. So how can we get them up to the next level where they're noticing the cane, especially those who have some vision? I mean, somebody had mentioned before that a lot of them rely on a lot of vision and sometimes that's not reliable. So how can we get them to the point that they notice the cane even when their vision says it's flat or they're not expecting it to be there. They think of somewhere else.
Well, one of the things I've found to be very helpful is partial occlusion, uh, where you occlude the bottom half of the, the student's vision so that they can see around them and be distracted by and, and you know, give them a visual task while they cannot see what's six feet in front of them on the floor, on, on the ground. Um, so that the only way they can get information about what's in front of their feet is with the cane. And that's been very helpful. Um, oh, Amy, did, did you have some suggestions? Yeah, I think if you totally blindfold someone, uh, it might be scary for them and it might be fearful and I don't want them to be afraid to come to my next you know, lesson. So I like the idea of using uh, some light perception you know, glasses. These are just safety glasses from Sam's Club Walmart for about $2. And I put some of the magic tape all over it so it covers up you know, most of the visual field. But I do like the idea that you had of maybe just blocking the bottom part. That way they can't see their feet or their cane tip. And you know that will help to build trust in their cane, or they may they might notice things. And they to me, they always notice something different because they're not looking at their feet. So it could be the texture of the ground that they notice that they didn't notice before when they were looking at it. And I think it's important to have all of your senses engaged when you're learning all of these new concepts or even practicing ones that you practice for a while until we get to proficiency of the skill. Oh, great. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, some of my clients, uh, one of them in particular said she didn't want the blindfold because she didn't want to be in the dark. And so wearing something like you have there with where, where their, their vision is occluded, they can't see anything, but it lets the light in would have been very helpful for her. So thank you. Great suggestion. Oh, Chris, did you want to add something? This is Chris. I was just going to say is one of the areas you were filling out, but you may be moving on, is that it can be helpful to do some proprioceptive work, uh, even with occlusion, so that people begin to understand what does that feel like in my wrist? Because it may be very foreign to them to understand that wrist movement with a cane drop off. Super. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I have found that often students who don't notice the cane dropping over an edge, sometimes even when they're expecting it, it's because they haven't developed an awareness of their kinesthetic sense. Um, you know, this is why it's so important that, that they not move their arm when they're moving the cane, that they're only moving the cane with their wrist. Because um, if the cane drops and everything else is the same, you know, the elbow and the shoulder are not uh, moving, that uh, they'll feel that little bit of a stretch with the cane dropped over. And uh, you know, if, if your whole arm is moving, it's hard to feel that little slight subtle difference. So that's why the arm has to be nice and still. And uh, well, let me, I'll, I'll show you a, 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 a something I do to help them develop that sense, a little exercise we do. So. All right. So if they're walking along and they don't notice, especially with, usually research shows it's easier to feel the drop off if you're using constant contact, you know, sliding the cane than if you're using touch technique. But say they're using touch technique and it drops over the edge and they don't notice it. And I've had this happen even when they know it's there and they said that they can't feel the difference. They can't feel the cane dropping over the edge. And I have found just like, uh, Chris said, it's because they're not aware of their uh, kinesthetic sense. So what I do, the exercise I do is to have them, I have them stand on the edge of the curb, or if they're not, if they really need some help, maybe a stair, so it's a higher drop off, a bigger difference. So I have them stand, if they're right-handed, I stand with the curb on their right, you know, right on the edge of the curb, um, with the curb on their right, left-handed um, opposite, and then um, I'm gonna step back, but you can imagine I'm still standing on the edge of the curve. And have them put the tip of the cane uh, on the top of the curve, right at the edge, and then just slide it just a half an inch and drop it over the edge. And if they're holding their arms still, they should feel that little bit of a stretch. And I don't tell them, no, uh, you're gonna feel it in your wrist, I say, where do you feel that? Where do you feel, how do you, where do you notice the difference in, in those two positions at the top of the curve and at the, you know, down at the bottom of the curve? And so far, everybody has said, I feel it in my wrist. 
and and you know, but it's really subtle. And I say, yes, it is very subtle, but you have to pay attention. This is where it's all at. It is in the wrist, and so notice that. So, so anyway, so that's an exercise I do that helps them become aware of that of that drop off. Okay. Well, um, well, I'm glad some of you shared uh, your suggestions for getting students up to the fourth and final level of cane proficiency. Uh, before we move on, I have a question for you. Remember, we, we've talked about stage one, you know, the beginner stage, needing to have segments of cane training interspersed throughout the lessons with anywhere from 10 minutes to six hours, or maybe even overnight between those segments before resuming the cane training. And we said that during those segments of cane training um, and practice in stages one and two, the student needs to be able to concentrate on the cane skills. We also said that between these segments, when you're, when you're working on cane training, you can work on other skills as long as they aren't too similar. And I use that time uh, for all kinds of skills, including shorelining, um, orientation, and, and using landmarks and problem solving skills, uh, 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 sensory awareness, et cetera. And, and we said that until they have achieved proficiency with the cane, when they're doing something else like these other activities, we provide for their safety. Um, and some of you have said that um, you'll, you'll tell the student that they, uh, they may be using the cane between uh, these cane training segments of the lesson, but we tell them that we're not concentrating on the cane right now and that we are actually providing for their safety. If they are approaching a hazard and we think that their cane technique is not yet achieve, uh, reliable enough to detect it, we're gonna intervene, we may intervene. So my question is this, do you think we should blindfold the student during the cane training segments uh, when they need to concentrate on their cane skills? What do you think? Oh, Amy, thank you, great. All right, well, so what do you think? Well, yes, I think it is a good idea to, uh, and, and I do use a blindfold or occluded glasses during each lesson or some lessons, but uh, I think when they are having that targeted intervention of really concentrating on a specific skill, I don't think they should be blindfolded because they need every ounce of input uh, that they can rely on. And it's clear, and I need to be clear to the person that I'm working with that uh, we're going to do this, you know, I'm going to have you concentrate with all the senses that you have, including your vision, but then we'll, we'll uh, have a little challenge part where we might use some uh, a blindfold or some light perception glasses and see if you can still maintain that same thing. Wow, thank you so much, Amy. So you think that blindfolding is an important part of your orientation mobility program, but not when they're concentrating on the cane skills, right? Oh, Jeannie, do you wanna share? Oh, yes. Um, in my opinion, I do feel that being under blindfold, it can be a valuable phase, uh, a, a valuable experience in later phases. But when a student is trying to concentrate on learning a specific skill, um, it can be really difficult for them to maintain that focus when all of their effort is into focusing on what they're trying to do, be it like walking in step, um, and, and so forth, or keeping their hand at midline. Um, I have a personal experience when I was going through my O&M training, I was a very proficient traveler under blindfold, but eight years later, I had been out of practice uh, traveling under blindfold with the cane, and I was in an unfamiliar and busy city. Um, and I just felt so uncomfortable. I remember, I didn't expect it either. It really took me by surprise. I felt very uncomfortable. I felt kind of clammy and sweaty and my heart was racing. And I felt like I had aged 50 years instead of being able to walk with you know, my head erect and a good posture and in step and everything. I was there, I could barely lift my feet off the ground and I was basically sliding my feet and walking very, very slowly. And um, I just felt very uncomfortable. And so when I think about that experience for myself and of my students, I think, yes, it's a good, um, opportunity to learn how to read your cane under blindfold, but it should be done at a later stage. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Jeannie. 
Yeah, I found the same thing. I, I used to blindfold my students when they were learning to use the cane and it was very distracting. I remember one student in particular who had balance issues when blindfolded. And I wish it had occurred to me back then to blindfold her when she can focus on the non-visual information or the problem solving or whatever it was that uh, was, she was trying to learn using the blindfold experience to help her learn and not blindfold her when during those intense uh, segments of the lesson when she's learning to use the cane, at least until she's in stage three. So we seem to agree then that blindfolding students who need to concentrate while learning to use the cane in stages one and two, it can be distracting and make it harder for them to advance to the next stage. But blindfolding and partial occlusion and, and the similar strategies are very appropriate for students in stage three who are trying to learn to notice and use the non-visual information that they get from the cane. Actually, this fits with a position paper that was recently approved by the Orientation Mobility Division saying that occlusion should be introduced during stage three of learning the cane when the students have mastered their cane techniques and can use the cane safely during distractible moments, which includes you know, blindfolding and having them learn the non-visual information. All right, so thank you everybody. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I think it's time for you to take us to the next segment, the next session. Okay, so um, the, the next segment um, is going to be a time for you to do a little brainstorming on your own um, based on what we've discussed so far. So what Donna has shared about motiv um, motivation and what we've been discussing about the stages of the cane. We'd like you to, to think about what we've been discussing. Uh, think about how these ideas already do or might in the future impact your learning and teaching, especially of cane skills. What are the benefits of these approaches um, that we've been discussing? And are there any limitations or challenges to um, including what we've been talking about in your practice? And we're going to give you about two minutes. So if you have a piece of paper um, or if you just want to, to think hard and, and rem remember your thoughts, after which point we're going to send you um, into breakout rooms to share your thoughts with a colleague. This is just an opportunity to a, another way to reflect on your thinking is to share with someone else. So Donna is organizing the um, the distribution of folks into groups. If everybody's ready, I will send you on your way. I think everybody's back. Well, give you a second to um, get through the, the warp of <laughs> moving from one room to another. Um, we have a few minutes on our agenda just to, um, for anybody who would like to raise their hand and, or, and open their mic or add to the chat, um, you know, anything um, you thought was significant or particularly interesting, either in your own notes or in, your, in, the, in a discussion that you had with a colleague. And Leah. This is Leah speaking. I just wanted to say that um, it was just really great to talk, to meet with someone because I'm a practicum student right now, so I'm still in the program. So it was great to talk to a professional that is an O&M instructor and talk about how I'm not, I'm not like aware yet how to know what's like comfortable, like knowing what stage everyone is at and being able to talk to someone who's already doing it. It was, um, we had a great conversation. I, I can relate definitely as a practicum student myself, Leah. So, Jean. Oh, hello. Um, I was with Kylie, and towards the end, we were just talking about um, how this has been really useful because when you're in an O and program or have gone through one or you're reading textbooks, you learn all of the textbook skills, but you don't always learn like, well, what do you do in these different scenarios and situations with real students in the real world with real experiences and everything. So this has just been really helpful, just what we've been discussing about, you know, it's okay to focus on, you know, one thing at a time and, um, you know, and like knowing about the different stages that students are in. Yeah. So um, we have a comment that came in from someone who is um, on a train. So 
um, I'm going to mispronounce her name, but Michexa says um, she had a great conversation. You got it right. <laughs> okay. Same. About motivation. Um, and um, how, how important I've been doing my practicum with both um, school age students as well as older adults. And I can't, it's equally important <laughs> regardless of, of age and, um, and situation and circumstances. And sometimes in the schools, we, um, you know, they don't have the choice to learn. And so, so finding that motivation can be hard. <laughs> would be hard because yes, you have to go to O and M class or you know the instructor has to be there. But um any anyone else have a discussion about motivation? Is there any way that you're gonna maybe changing the way you teach now that uh, you know after this experience? One thing that I had a question about it's sort of about motivation, but when you're working you know, I work uh, one day a week right now at an Industries of the Blind affiliate. And so we're working with a lot of folks who have been visually impaired most of their lives. And some of them are coming in with great cane skills and some of them are coming in with not so great. And what do you do when you're using these ideas when you're teaching somebody who already thinks they know how to use the cane just fine and has been using it in that same way for years but you know their cane is sweeping back about one step one sweep for five steps or they're scrubbing back and forth on the line and just covering the area to the right of their right foot or... um, oh wow jack that is a great question rebecca you had a student like that just recently can you share a little bit about that yeah, I remember. So we um, we were working with a student. I think the the main purpose w initially was to um, provide orientation to a college campus, and he, um, you know, he'd been a cane traveler for a while. So we came to to campus ready to do the orientation, and as as we were um, finding the routes to his classes, we started noticing that wow, these this is not anywhere near the ideal um, cane skills that we would like to be seeing for this student. And um, somewhere towards the end of the first day, we, we just brought it up, you know, not, you know, saying, you know, we know we're here for orientation, but we thought we should let you know that what we're seeing as far as um, your hand position and your walking with a cane is, is probably not, not the way that we would normally expect to see somebody traveling um you know it, there are we talked about some of the dangers the downsides to um not walking in step to um not having a good a good coverage with your cane arc and um asked if this was something that the student was interested in working on because like Donna has been saying about motivation, right? <laughs> if the student's not interested in fixing it, then you know we're our purpose is to do orientation, and we can go back to doing that. But in this case, the student was like, "Whoa, this is news to me. You're telling me I I, I could be doing better in my um, hand position arc. All of all of the things we've been talking about, um, fundamental cane skills." And, and the student was very interested in working on that and a few other things. So Donna was able to um, negotiate the things that needed to be worked out for us to you know, go beyond just the orientation and start working with that student on keen skills. Right, I arranged for the funding. And we went back to the beginning. <laughs> We, went, we we didn't like pretend the student was in stage three because the student was not in stage three. Um, we went, we started with very basics, um, you know, teaching each of the skills separately and then bringing them together. Um, it took the, took, uh, you know, some reteaching and going back and integrating and working with the student. Um, in the, as Donna has been saying, and as we've been talking about, we didn't try to, um, to teach too much at once. And we also didn't try to um, 
you know, focus on cane skills while we were doing orientation. For example, if the student is building their cognitive map of campus, then that's what we're focusing on. So we um, tried not to interfere with that development. But once the student was, was um, in stage two and was able to tell us about being in, um, tell us about their, their um, skills, they were able to in, and demonstrate them um, independently with for very short periods of time when they were concentrating, then we started assigning um, homework, which um, for for them it was uh, you know just to find a find a quiet spot to practice for like twenty seconds and um, help. We worked with a student to identify a way they could set a timer or 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 guesstimate about twenty seconds of practice, and we checked in with the student um, using te text messaging throughout the week to. Um, you know, kind of continue that motivation and, and providing positive feedback and um, let, telling them, you know, we're so glad you're practicing. So that when he, um, you know, gradually, we, we worked on other skills as well. We introduced concepts around street crossings and things like that. But, but um, gradually, we saw just fantastic improvement um, in the students' keen skills. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we had, uh, uh, so it was in, he had actually went through the stages very much Jack, like any of the other students. It didn't take him any longer to get the skills he needed than somebody who's starting fresh and doesn't have to undo bad habits. So it's really just basically the same. And he went through the same stages everyone goes through. Like Rebecca said, he was in the beginning stage. We had to really, you know, sit your hand and really work on those skills. And then he went into the second stage and um, that that's when he could practice on his own. When he came back um, at our next lesson, he had, he had achieved stage three and uh, I will contact the student and ask if it's okay to share some videos that I took of him. So here's the student walking in perfect technique. Your cane technique is perfect. Oh, wow. I was even thinking about it. <laughs> oh, cool. So it's just natural now, huh? Yep. Cool. So thank you, Rebecca, so much. Okay. So Jack, I hope that answers your question. And um, Rebecca, was there anybody else who had their hand raised? Um, Michael, I think, has his hand raised. Uh, yes, I... <laughs> I really relate to what Jack was saying. I did some work with people who had been established in the way they used the cane for a long time. And some of them were uh, terrible in all of the ways that Jack was describing and even a few more I can think of that uh, he probably also saw. Uh, and, and what I found was there needed to be some reason for them to have a motivation to change. If their cane technique, as lousy as I thought it was, was getting them where they needed to go in the factory, getting them back and forth to work and getting them uh, around the community enough to do their work and nothing had uh, uh, caused them to fall down, fall down a flight of stairs or whatever, they really didn't have much interest in working with me, nor did I try to change their cane technique. But mm -hmm. if something happened where they said, hey, this didn't work for me, that gave me the end to say, okay, can we start back with your cane technique here? And uh, just let me show you a couple of things that might give you more information out of the cane. So Donna, everything you say about breaking down uh, the issues with the cane into these five phases, etc., is useful information because when there's a problem, it helps us evaluate the problem. But I think also there has to be a time when we say, okay, that's not what the person is asking for us to evaluate right now. Beautiful. By the way, Rebecca, um, uh, Angela and Chris wrote uh, 
I'm not sure which one. Uh, this presentation helped me make the decision to not purchase those superhero stickers to motivate my little red firecracker. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Angela wrote that. All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move us into the next um, and, and final and most interactive maybe so portion of tonight's program. We, um, we want to have a, you know, just a, a big group brainstorming session around and, and sharing around strategies that you use when um, teaching this, especially this, this set of cane skills that we've been talking about tonight. What's, how do you, for everything from motivating to helping students move through the stages to the specific pieces of the technique that we've been talking about. And I wanted to start with a, um, a prompt that was actually um, submitted by someone when they registered for this workshop. So uh, one of your fellow participants asked if we could give feedback on how do you accommodate for, or do you accommodate for a student who really prefers um, holding the holding the cane off center. And is there anyone who wants to share on that topic? And Michael, your hand is oh, yes. I have to, as someone who taught O and M without the benefit of uh, the comms degree or going back to the training for a number of years before I became a comms. Um, I really just learned about all the theories why. Uh, uh, midline was supposed to work best when I got into comm school. And uh, my feeling is that if someone is more comfortable using the cane uh, off to whichever side of, of hand they're using it, and one of the things I really encourage, by the way, is uh, that a person become comfortable using the cane ambidextrously because, let's face it, the cane is uh, a little bit tiring to use. And uh, if you are uh, able to use it comfortably in either hand, uh, you're going to be able to travel twice as far as oh, uh, comfortably as you can if you are just absolutely only a left-hander or only a right-hander. Uh, but if they are going to be using the cane off to a side, then the concentration is to learn the imbalanced arc and to learn to be comfortable with the imbalanced arc so you still know they're getting good coverage uh, across the body. And secondly, uh, I tend to think that if a person is not going to use midline, you need to add about two inches to the length of the cane from the way we traditionally usually start out measuring a cane, because if they've got the cane off to one side or the other, the chances are very good that their hand position is going to be about two inches back from where it is if they're using midline. Just a couple of thoughts I've developed over the years uh, working with that sort of thing. Uh, thanks, Michael. And um, Chris was next with the hand raising, or Angela and Chris. I uh, agree with uh, Michael. And uh, though if you're about to take your test, I encourage folks to go with whatever the big books, uh, the red books tell you to do. Uh, I do not, I do not force the point on hand centered. Uh, I give people the option of using an open palm or to the side, whatever works best with the understanding that what we're really trying to do is to provide next step preview and to be able to show them uh, what happens when you're near a, a street sign or a pole and why it's important to be so diligent about the cane arc. But if they can maintain that arc and have more comfort in their wrists, uh, it doesn't have to be at your belt buckle. Uh, I used to do things like having a, a student hold a book under their forearm so that their hand would stay centered because if they move their book, move their arm, the book would fall. Now I, I think I was torturing them. Um, <laughs> so it, it changes over time, uh, but I, I uh, Maybe I've gotten uh, a little bit uh, loose in my brain over the last 20 years, but um, I, I'm much more flexible in what works for people. And Jack, and then we'll go to Donna. Yep. I was just gonna say, I have also been not forcing that, but I've been saying that I would rather see a consistent hand position so that they can then develop a consistent arc rather than 
exactly in the middle. So. Thanks, Doc. And Donna? Thank you. Um, I really appreciate everything that everyone has said. I, I totally agree that it's not necessary except for one thing, and that is walking into a pole. Now that you've seen the cane technique, we've placed a pole in such a way that if my cane misses it, I will be bumping into it with my shoulder. So let's see what happens. Oh. So the cane went right around it, and I had no warning about it. Now we're going to move the pole so that if my cane misses it, and it will, I'm going to be um, walking into it with my face, not my shoulder. So let's see what happens. My hand is centered. Ah, this time the cane, the shaft of the cane hit it um, and warned me about it. That's because the pole was near to the center of my body or near to where my hand was. Let's see what happens if I keep it so that the pole, I'm going to be approaching the pole with the center of my body, but now the, the hand that holds the cane is going to be over to the right. And let's see what happens. Oh, and again, it missed it. It's because even though um, the, cane, the pole was right in front of me, in the center of me, my hand was not centered, so the shaft of the cane did not hit it. So wherever the hand is, um, the, where the cane is moving, the, the, uh, you know, the shaft will contact the pole, but only if it's close to where the hand is held. So if you hold the hand centered, that means that you're protected in the center of your body, including your face, from walking into poles that you didn't expect. All right, so I totally agree with everybody else here. It's a matter of choice. And, and I explain why you would want to center your hand. And, and I ask them, do you want to center your hand? And if they say yes, do you want me to help you, you know, make your life a living hell you know, and, and bug you? Yes, please do. And if they don't want it, I'm fine. They can move it to the side. Now, if they want it, they want to center their hand, but they're so tired of getting jabbed in the stomach. That I find that that's why a lot of people move their hand off to the side, because if they move it to the side, it's not going to get jabbed. So I do what I call the kick to, oh, sorry, there we go. Okay. When Donna stands up, we can see that she's wearing bright pink animal pajama bottoms and bunny slippers with pink ears that reach halfway up her shin. Okay, so I'm gonna have my husband show, help me show my, um... oh my gosh, I forgot, Fred, I, I forgot my pajamas, I'm sorry. And I'm wearing little um, bunny slippers that my uh, granddaughter helped me make. Those are her ears that she put on. Excuse me while I get more appropriately dressed. That's your COVID uniform. That's my COVID uniform. I thought they'd get a kick out of that. There, that's better. Now I'm dressed professionally head to toe. And I'm going to show you something um, that I learned. Someone told me I found it to be true. I've got my hand centered and I'm gonna turn so that you can see the, the cane from the side. And if I'm holding the cane such that the line of my forearm uh, extends down into the same line as the cane and the cane jams in something, it will go, it will go down and in into my, my body. <laughs> so, but if I bring my forearm up so that it's more horizontal, that makes the cane more vertical so that the angle of my um, arm is not the same as a cane and my arm is out a little bit from my body. Now when the cane jams, it goes up and away and not down into my body. So I have my clients understand that they need to hold it out and a little bit um, so that their arm is a little bit more horizontal. And so I'm gonna have him, first of all, hold it so wrong so that we know it's not gonna be a good result. So the arm is almost, let's center your hand a little bit. And he's got it so that um, even though his hand is, you know, there is an angle where, where his hand is centered. Um, it's, if you look at it from the side, why don't you turn to the side a little bit? Yeah, from the side, 
the angle of the arm is extending straight down into the, um, uh, the same as the cane. So if we turn back again. So we're going to have you have it close to you as well as at a bad angle. And let's see what happens when I kick. Now, when I say kick, I'm not really kicking. I'm taking my foot and pushing the tip towards him, um, at, which, which is kind of what happens when you jam into something that the tip stays there and you keep going so that it's moving, the, the tip is coming toward you. So I'm gonna do it very abruptly. That's why I call it a kick test because I kind of kick the, the, the tip towards him. And so let's see what happens when I kick it towards him and he's holding it badly. Oh, thank you for extra. So it went down into his body. So let's have him hold it up. Um, good, good, excellent, excellent, excellent. So he's holding it away from the body and he's holding it uh, with his forearm more horizontal than the cane. The cane is more vertical. So let's see what happens when I quote kick. And again, I'm not kicking it. I'm just pushing the tip towards him with my foot very abruptly. Ah, it went up and away. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Hopefully, you guys were able to see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. So um, in fact, this one time I was just a couple months ago, um, I was working with a client, uh, deaf and a little bit of vision. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Frederick. <laughs> Fred sneaks up behind Donna and holds up a big sign saying, happy birthday, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> He made me a little corsage. I don't know if you can get that down. Can you get that? He had made me a little corsage that I'll, I'll put on for my birthday and, um, and our anniversary and all kinds of stuff. 50, it'll be 53 years this year, right, Fred? We've wow. been married. Anyway, yeah. So she was working on uh, street crossing and um, I still had to stay six feet away from her, but she was, you know, monitoring how well she could scan and whatever. We finished it all and we're wrapping stuff up and putting it away. She said, could you give me the kick test again? You know, so she wanted to see, but she's still holding it right. So that kick test I found to be really helpful. It uh, helps them understand how they're supposed to hold it. And, and so that it, and when they can hold it so that they don't jam themselves there, it's much easier to keep their hands centered. They're not so motivated to, to kind of move it off to the side so they don't get hurt. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Chris and Angela's hands raised. Donna, in, in addition, uh, especially when a person is just learning to use a cane, sometimes they're holding it more like a hammer. Their grip is extraordinarily tight and just loosening the grip uh, will allow the cane to go more up than in. Beautiful. Yeah. Great. So you got to. Leah. So um, I was working with a student who was working on these two skills actually with Amy Downard, who's on this call. And she was having, the student was um, low vision and deaf. So she had dual sensory loss. And um, Amy had um, made Velcro neon bracelet for the client so that she could remember to center her cane. And so when we moved on to the next step, I think she wasn't using that bracelet, but then Amy reintroduced it so that she was able to have that there so she could work on the next skill, but then also reference that uh, neon color and make sure that her hand was in the right placement. Yeah, that's so interesting. Amy, are you, can you come and explain more about that? Yes, I had the idea that um, I wanted to bring focus to uh, my student's hand, her wrist placement, because we're trying to center her hand or try to teach that skill. So I thought, what could I put on there? So something high contrast, because she does have vision and she can see in her lower uh, visual field. So you can use a hair scrunchie, like a bright, colorful one. They're, you know, inexpensive and everywhere. And then there's other fabrics. There are other things out there, scarves that you can just tie real quick. And then we had some fun foam in the office. So I had uh, three colors that I brought that day of yellow, pink, and orange. And she chose the yellow. And I'm like, yes, that's the brightest one. It looks like they are about eight inches long and two inches wide. And APH has these pre-cut um, Velcro squares. So I just put those on. So she could uh, quickly fasten it on her hand and then we can wipe them off and uh, sanitize them. And now with her cane, we could stop and talk. I could have her freeze. So I could have her freeze and then we could check her hand placement, her specifically her wrist placement and say, is that still centered? Did it go off center and talk about it? But it was just a high contrast way to target her hand at, 
And so we can talk about the skill that we were trying to develop of centering her a wrist while using the cane. Um, on Michael's hand came back up. Uh, it did. And the little video that Donna just showed uh, reminded me of another video of hers that I watched and that has always stuck with me through uh, anything I have taught or done after I've seen that video. And what it was, was a video that, uh, uh, where she was showing how even if one is uh, in step, it was possible for uh, an obstacle to be missed in a few situations. And she had some percentages worked out about how much that is. I see she's nodding, so she knows the video I'm talking about. And I noticed uh, in the demonstration that she just played with the post uh, that she was, of course, in step when she was demonstrating that. One of the things that I guess I've thought of and I'd like to get her opinion on is okay if someone insists on using the cane to one side or the other and they are uh, in step most of the time. It seems to me like uh, if one is able to actually move the cane faster than in step, which is really quite a challenge sometimes for a person who walks reasonably fast, but it seems like that would be another way to solve the problem. And if you were going slightly faster than the in-step rate of cane arc, would that not find the pole even if you were uh, using the cane off to one side? Yeah, it would definitely make it more likely. You'd have to do it all the time though. Or I guess you're thinking, you're anticipating there's a pole here, I better. One thing you could just do is center your hand though. The, yeah, the uh, you're right. That that's more simple, <laughs> but uh, but thinking, Michael. Yeah, <laughs> always always thinking. <laughs> I think Amy has her hand up. Yes, I know we've been taught to teach the standard grip like a handshake, so that seems like it's more in line with the cane, which wouldn't you know it wouldn't pass the kick test. So I, because we live in Hawaii, we like to go swimming. Uh, I've uh, shared an idea of instead of a handshake, like you're diving into the water and then your hands are at midline and then one goes away and then I put the cane in the other hand. And I think that's um, been pretty helpful to get the hand position kind of just right. So it would go up, the, the cane would go up instead of into the body. Were there other questions, people who wanted to get ideas on a strategy that they're struggling with? After Eliza. Oh, um, one thing I'll um, bring up for moving the cane in step um, is if they played soccer, I'll mention, you know, kicking the ball, um, you're running the ball with the feet or kicking the cane out of the way of like the foot stepping forward. So it ends up being on the opposite side. One of the things that has always stuck with me from cane class was Rona Pogrand's kick the cane out of the way, because if you're thinking about in step from that perspective, then to kick, the cane is moving uh, opposite the foot at the time the foot is being raised. It's not moving when the foot is landing. And uh, so uh, I, I have used that a lot and I love that. I have to admit that I learned it from a person who had been trained strictly with the structured discovery uh, method uh, in Iowa, but that was something that she'd picked up somewhere and uh, she liked it and said, well, if you're gonna teach this stuff, this is something you ought to learn. And, oh, Catherine's hand was up. I just wanted to comment to Michael, actually. Michael, I learned the kick the cane out of the way, actually from a client. Um, when I was instructing, and I was using language like forward foot, and he said, oh, you mean kick the cane out of the way. And I was like, yeah. And ever since I learned that from him, that's what I use. <laughs> I, I think that it must be going around among <laughs> the blindness community because, as I said, I learned it from this uh, blind lady in Iowa a long time before I read it in Rona's uh, taps. <laughs> so funny, yeah. I've discovered a lot of people, when I, when I talk about that, 
they will end up starting to move the cane to the right as they put their left foot down and starting to move the cane to the left as they put their right foot down and having a lot of trouble getting in rhythm. And I'm not quite sure how to explain that better because that was the way I was taught. Let's see. Donna and Chris both have hands raised. Does either either of you have a suggestion for Jack? <laughs> I, I was going to suggest for that, um, but why don't we let Angela and Chris go first and then if it was about rhythm. Uh, it, typically when we're having fun, we're learning. So if we can make a game of, um, let's just say giving them three or four steps to walk or maybe a little bit longer <clears throat> and basically having them freeze to determine if they've stayed in step, stayed in rhythm, without telling them they're correct, they have to decide on their own. They begin to develop their own self-monitoring process, but it's a game of how long can you do it for? You don't know what I'm gonna say freeze. Uh, and then when you do say freeze, they're self-checking. Wow, should I go ahead, uh, Rebecca? Yes, I like that a lot. Go ahead. Oh That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, um, so, um, what I do to try to people, sometimes people have the rhythm normally. And so, because that, that's the hardest one to do. But what I will do is um, uh, have them, you know, if they're just not getting the rhythm and I, and I avoid having them walk to something that I'm singing or whatever, because I don't want them to learn to walk in rhythm with something outside. I want them to walk with their cane moving in rhythm with their foot. And so I want it to be internal. So I try not to do singing and whatever, but I, I know that works for a lot of people. But what I will do is have them um, walk while doing something in relation to their feet, like hitting their hip as they walk. And I'll hit my hip too. And so we'll be walking along and, and we're just tuning it to her or his feet and, and getting in that so that they, and sometimes just even doing this is like, Oh, I don't get it. So um, if they get that or if they're having trouble with that, then I'll have them. And I say, I don't care about the arc or anything. I just want the, to hear the tap of the, the, the you know, the, the, the cane tapping with so that they're doing something, hitting their hip, clapping, something with their body that's in time with their feet. And when they can do that, then we say, okay, now we'll try, try it with the cane. So far, I've found that to work. One time it took us a week every day, so they, but most people get that quicker than that. Who had their hand raised and it's down now? Let's see, we've got... It, it was me that had the hand raised and put it down. Uh, Donna, you really kind of took the wind out of my sails because oh, I had my hand raised to uh, talk about uh, singing to help with rhythms and some of the songs and chants that I had done with students. And uh, I certainly buy what you're saying about uh, the the risks involved in that. I'll, I'll admit I'm a singer. So uh, uh, that's definitely oh, what I do. Michael, I think if it works, singing, apparently it does because a lot of people do it. So I, I shouldn't have said anything. Um, if, if it works and the kids get into the rhythm, who am I to say that? And Rebecca, I'm sorry I smacked you for doing it with my student. Oh, it's okay. I, I, I was one of those that took a little extra practice from Donna until I got in, <laughs> was able to walk in rhythm, but I, I found that tapping on my, on my hip was helpful too, so. Um, as a TVI, I used to sing to my students to get them to move their cane well before I had O&M, any O&M knowledge, really. But Amy, is it Amy? I, this is Amy. So, yeah, uh, because the instep is a lot of uh, different uh, movement patterns, I was re-looking at one of the textbooks, and I was thinking about when the hand uh, that's holding the cane goes out, I'm right-handed, so to the right, my left foot should be landing on the ground. <laughs> And so I had a couple of clients sit down and we practiced this just every time our hand flexed to the right, uh, we would tap our left foot. And I had some, you know, I'm an 80s girl, so I had some 80s music on. So I had a nice beat to it. So every time we would just practice on when that hand hyperflexes or whatever they call it, 
outward, my opposite foot should be landing. And that was a lot of fun. And we tried that, you know, sitting down first with that uh, song playing, and then we would stand up and try it too. So instead of doing the whole in step, we would just concentrate on that movement pattern was supposed to match my foot pattern. And that was fun. I like to try to do that again. We only get to try it a one time, but it was fun. Great suggestion. I thought I saw a hand up. Yeah, Jack had his hand up. Yeah. Oh. That wasn't a hand, that was a pause. Oh. Okay, <laughs> that was a pause. Um, somebody earlier had said something about wanting to know more about stairs. Does anybody want to make suggestions of how they teach stairs? I've been spending a fair bit of time teaching stairs recently because it's one of the biggest safety issues we've got at Greensboro Industries. We've got 150 blind folks and 14 stairwells. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been really emphasizing, you know, be not first, just finding the first step and locating it precisely. You know, so, you know, cane drops off, bring it up to vertical, press it against the step. That's the one time that I really want them to have the cane, their hand in front of their body. Mm -hmm. because it's a lot harder to step past it yeah. and bring it up to vertical in front of them, walk up to it. And then however they're going to go down the stairs, they're going to go down the stairs, but they know where that first step is. And um, I don't know if that's emphasizing that over the rest of the technique more than I should, but it's sort of where I have been recently. Catherine? Yeah, Jack, actually, I would, I'd love to ask you, um, do you emphasize, how do you address the grip when you're teaching the grip for going up the stairs? You know, I'm just wondering about everybody's, um, when we talk about being flexible. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm interested so in that. I have been, let me get where I can actually see what you can see. Um, you say for, for particularly for going up the stairs? Correct. You know, that sort of reversed thumbs yep. down kind thumbs of. Down. Yep. Yeah. But I have a lot of people who hate it. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is awkward. I hate this. It's uncomfortable. It hurts my shoulder. So, so you know, I think the most the important thing is the cane gets to vertical at the step. They can step up to it. Then they I want the cane to be away from their feet. So not just coming off the step they're on, you know, up and out in front of them, but you know, whether they're doing a thumbs down grip or sort of a pencil grip, but really with the first finger pushing back toward them, the thumb below it pushing out and pushing the tip of the cane away and into the riser. You know, something that sends the tip of the cane forward that holds that their arm is, at a position where it can stay up. It's not drifting back down on them and getting back in to tangle up with their feet. And so it will swing free when they get to the top step. And, you know, they know that they're there. I appreciate that insight. But, but I'm, yeah. not, I'm not really, you know, I will show people this and I've had a lot of people who really like it. Some people will say, oh, that feels weird, but you know, I think the vertical cane and having it in a stable grip, whatever that is. I appreciate that because sometimes I think it must be the method in which I'm teaching it because I love that. I love yeah, the feedback that you get from the, I love how it's, I'm like, but don't you, you hear the slap, 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 Don't you like yeah. that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, people want to lean on the cane. They want to like, like think it's a staff. I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this so, does make you much less likely to lean on it. Yes. The, the thumbs down, That's even than a pencil grip. I mean, you can hold onto a cane and push down, and you know, use it like a walking staff. Oh, uh, how many agree that the flexibility? It doesn't really matter what the grip is. How many? How many disagree with that? Let me put it that way. <laughs> One disagree. Megan, you disagree? It should be it should be it should be the way that we were taught. 
Oh no. Oh, sorry. No opposite. <laughs> I was like when I was in school and I was learning and I'm visually impaired myself. So growing up, I learned like pencil grip. And I was like, when I looked at the textbook and I was looking and I was trying and for some reason, my shoulder, I could not do the full flip and it wouldn't stay as vertical. And I was like, so frustrated. And I said to the instructor at the time, I was like, if I can't do this, what can I have my students do this? So I, I kind of show both ways at times too. Um, Cause you know, you have the some that like it and then you're going to have the others that are going to be like, I'm not doing that. Mm. So it's going to figure out what works best for them. Cool. Catherine, I think we're all in agreement. It's flexibility. And somebody mentioned not leaning on it because that, that is the killer, you know, that then it, then it won't go up to the next step. They're, 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 you know, so making sure that they don't lean on it, but otherwise hand grip doesn't matter. Whatever is comfortable. I, I think one other issue with stairs that uh, I've noticed having to remind people of, a lot of folks all of a sudden forget that uh, rule that the cane is supposed to show you what's going on about two steps before you get there. And immediately when that cane hits level ground, the student will start to walk as though they have made it to level <laughs> ground. And, and you really have to emphasize with beginning students, remember when you're going downstairs, that cane's going to get there a couple of steps before you do. So uh, you, you need to keep that in mind. And uh, it's kind of interesting. And it seems to help students remember this, actually, to tell them, OK, when you're going upstairs, it's usually going to be one step. But when you're going down, remember it's two or you're going to end up on your nose. Now, once somebody has established you know, how high up they're holding it or how far out their cane is reaching going down. A lot of times I will have, you know, when the cane touches, then it's one, if they're step, if they're walking reciprocally, stepping one step at a time, one, two, done. You know, so that they have some uh -huh. sort of thing to remember that now, okay, it hit the ground. Now one, two, now you're actually there. That's good. And I have, um, allowed them to decide how far up they want to mm -hmm. hold it, one step or two steps. But I'm a bear for being consistent then. I said, you can't hold it one step sometimes, two steps, one, and then you don't know what's going on. Same thing for going down. Michael, I thought it was only one step from, you know, when it hits the bottom that you, you have one more step yourself. Maybe we yeah. have longer, maybe you have a longer cane or something. I must be measuring my canes uh, with those yeah. people who are using the cane off to the side because it's normally two steps for the yeah. way I'm teaching it. I have also started teaching, and I did this when I started working with deaf blind people, but now I find that a lot of people like, they don't like having the cane gliding in air, going down and having nothing. So I teach them to tap as they go down. I wish I had some stairs here. Um, Do you have the cane out in diagonal? Like the technique? Uh, no, no, in fact, in fact. Oh, it's you have it like up, going up the stairs? No, the, we're going down. Mm -hmm. And, and I will uh, have them, first of all, drop it. Not like I said, I thought it was usually one step ahead. I, I don't know. I, I'll have to check my book again. I think when I was learning, there was no textbook. We had to write our own. Um, so I'll have to look again. But I thought I was taught to one step ahead. But regardless, whatever. I have them position the cane so that it's, you know, it hits that step. that They're, they're going to have it just a little bit below and have, have them drop it a little bit below you know, that. And then I have them anchor it and I swear, I said, I'm gonna bring tape tomorrow because I don't want that hand moving. Um, so their hand is anchored at their tip, at their hip. And I right now have my finger pointing down the shaft, but it could be, it could be to the side, it doesn't really matter, but they're, they're holding it like a spear would be, you know, so my, my fingers are underneath it. And then I say, as you take a step down, you lift, and I'm gonna exaggerate it, you lift up. And then as you step down, after you step, you drop it again. So it hits the back of that, you know, the, the edge of the next stair. And as they take a step, they're lifting it. And each time they step, it's, um, oh, I'm going to take you with me. And let me um, see if Fred can carry the, the computer over to the stairs. Hold on. Well, Fred has agreed to hold the webcam. So thank you, Fred. Well, I'm here on the stairs. I'm standing on the top at the edge of the top stair. And the normal technique that I was taught so long ago is that um, 
and I don't remember where we were holding our hand. I hold my hand near the hip. And the normal technique is to hold the cane, find where the edge of the next stair is, bring the cane tip maybe a couple inches below that, and then just raise it and it be consistently in the same place. Sometimes they raise it too high, but normally, you know, hopefully they, they learn to, to hold it so that as you go down, it just skims over the top and it touches nothing until the very bottom. And then you have one more step. And some of you have said it's two steps, but uh, sorry, about that. Um, but I was always taught it was one and that tends to be for me to reach two steps would be a, quite a stretch. Anyway, so here's what I do with people who want to be able to touch the stair. And I always give them a choice. I, I show them the traditional technique and then this one. And this one starts out the same. I'm standing at the top of uh, the stair with my feet at the edge and um, got my hand at my hip using my finger down the shaft. And again, I find where the, just about two inches below the edge of the next stair is. And I raise it when I take a step, but then I drop it. And so each time I take a step, I raise it so that it, I think if you don't raise it and take a step, it catches on the next stair. So, um, so each time I take a step, I raise it. So it goes over the next stair and then drop it back again. Again, my hand is staying at the hip. Raise it and take a step and, and touch back at the thing. Raise the cane, take a step and let it drop back. Raise the cane, take a step and let it drop back. Raise the cane and, oh, there's the bottom. So I have one more to go. So again, oh, it hit the bottom. I have one more. And that's what I teach for those who want to be in contact with the steer. Thank you. Donna, I think you and I are actually talking about the same thing, but uh, when clients are going downstairs, I've had clients that get to that last step and because the one foot hasn't come off the step yet, they think they're on level ground and then they kind of trip off the last step. So I've been calling that two steps down because when they get to that step, they've still got to bring the other foot to the level ground. So uh, you're counting actually each stair where I'm counting number of steps, right foot forward, one step, left foot forward, two steps. So actually we teach the same way. We, we have the, the uh, when the cane hits the bottom, they are one stair away from the bottom. And you're saying it's two steps because yeah, one foot on the bottom and then the second foot on the bottom. It's two you're steps. You're gonna bring that other foot down, that's right. I'm so relieved. So we all teach the same way. We just call it something different. Huh? Indeed. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michael. Actually, had, when I was doing my internship, I had a mobility specialist uh, say that he would sometimes with some of his, um, particularly with some multi-handicapped students, but essentially do the inverse of the upstairs, which is sort of a combination of what you were doing. And so holding the cane out in front of you and slapping the riser and swinging it out for each step. That sounds, it's mostly yeah. vertical hmm. rather than being out in front. Interesting. Well, that would, yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, one of the things that I noticed with my multiply disabled uh, blind students was uh, they sometimes when they were first learning would have a lot of trouble remembering, okay, I got steps now. Uh, do I want it in this position or do I want it in the downstairs position? And they would get mixed up as to which to use for which. I had never thought of trying to adapt the upstairs position for down. And I, I'm, I'm still a little bit, Res uh, reluctant, I guess, on that, but that's an interesting thought. Um, so the cane is slapping the riser, not of the step that you're on, but of the next step. But the next step, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. That's very interesting. I like your adaption, uh, uh, Jack, I'll have to try it. I always show my people, I, I say, this is the way I was taught. Mm -hmm. This is, the way it's, you know, correct. And this is the way some people prefer. And mm -hmm. then they, they pick. One thing that I loved of the way that we were taught in grad school for going downstairs is using the diagonal mm. technique position with the thumb underneath. Mm. You know, get find that second riser, I mean that second step, and then just squeeze with the thumb just a little bit, not not bending from the wrist. So you're you're holding the wrist stable, 
squeeze with the thumb and it brings the can tip up an inch. And that's all it needs. And just hold it. Yeah. And because otherwise people seem to want to raise it up too far and then they don't catch the landing. Mm -hmm. Well, for particularly for constant contact users that are normally using the cane in constant contact, mm -hmm. what you're talking about with the tip of the cane over the step and the shaft actually hitting the step is, I guess, what's really happening as you're going down. But essentially, I, I agree that for a lot of students having that cane not making contact with anything down as they're going downstairs doesn't make any sense. But uh, it, it almost seems to me like they're simply continuing with the cane into constant contact and it's sliding off of the stairs. Now that particularly works well with the roller marshmallow tips or with the roller ball tips like I have on this cane it, because uh, it just bounces right on down the steps and gives a lot more uh, tactile information than, than uh, maybe more than the person needs, but a lot of people feel comforted with that going downstairs. The, the one we've been doing, Jack and I have been doing, the tip never touches the stair, it just touches the bottom. But what an interesting thought is to hit the top of the next stair. I don't know, I don't That's know. That's what I was taught, sorry to interrupt. I was actually taught by another instructor too. I was learned textbook way. And then another instructor said to me, they call it almost like the glide method where Oops. with the rolling yeah. ball it glides down each step. And it actually, once you get to the bottom, because you are, we talk about the two different levels, I've taught you bring the cane, you extend it and bring it back. And you know that the cane is on two separate levels so that your body's not equal to your cane height. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I'll, <laughs> yes. I'll have to try that. That sounds really interesting. Hi, I'm back from the train. I'm actually home now. Um, I learned that same method from uh, that same colleague with the gliding step. And I see that really works for a lot of our workforce clients. Machek, so do you want to try was... gliding while your camera's already on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my clients. Oh, sure. I'll try to show the gliding as I could. Machek stands at the edge of the top stair. She has the shaft of the cane rest on the edge of the stair below the one she's standing on. As she starts to step down, she does not raise the cane, but lets it just glide along that edge until it hits the top of the next stair and then lets it glide forward on that stair till it goes over that stair and continues down the stairs in that fashion. <laughs> so with the gliding, it's placing the edge. And again, to someone who already assumed that we measured the step, so it's glide, 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 sweep. And is the tip sure off to that. the side or in front? The tip is off to the side. Okay. The tip is off to the side. So you already measured, you did your, you did your length, you did your width, your depth, and you place it right to the side at the edge. And you kind of have this hand structure here, keeping it there. And you just let it glide mm. down the steps. Mm. Sorry for my rug. <laughs> but Jessica, I hope but you that's don't what we were taught. Yeah. <laughs> when, when we post this, I'll add a description of what you're doing so people who don't see can. Sure, sure, sure. Oh, I see Jean would like to say something. Yeah, I did want to uh, inject something about how you hold the cane on the steps uh, when we're descending. I know I had some early experiences in my career when I was teaching people in some crowded places. Uh, the agency where I worked was crowded and I taught a lot of people in New York City subways. And I found that there were incidences, uh, not infrequent, where in crowded environments, students going down the stairs, if they held the cane completely forward uh, in front of the, their, uh, the hand that they were holding it in, that uh, they would run into people. Uh, going down, if they were descending faster than the person in front of them, they would sort of walk right into them. Uh, in one incident, I actually had to save the person 
who was in front of my student. And, and it also happened when people aren't paying attention and they're walking up the stairs and my student was going down the stairs. So I can't remember if I learned it in school as an option or if it's something I just decided I needed to modify. But I have the students generally hold the cane diagonally across their body. It gives some uh, preview and it prevents those kind of body slams that might happen. Now, the, uh, the techniques that I saw other people using, that doesn't preclude those. You know, you either hold the cane above the rise or you can uh, tap the rise like I uh, like demonstrated earlier. But that's my two cents on that. How interesting. I'm glad we someone raised the question of stairs. Yeah. What an interesting collection of very different techniques. I think stairs are one of my um, favorite lessons to teach. I spent a good time with that, both um, at programming when I was an intern and observing the colleagues at my agency. So I personally love teaching stairs and escalators because a lot of the clients that I see have an anxiety about that. So I'm always thinking, okay, let's place myself in their shoes and how can we tackle this together with you feeling safe and motivated to want to get from one level to the other? So I like to work yeah, on different else techniques. Feels like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like to work on different techniques. I really techniques like teaching stairs because, too. Um, yeah, I, I love it. I think it's um, a lesson that just really pushes the motivation a bit because once they feel, oh my gosh, I'm able to go both up and down the stairs, then they feel they can travel almost anywhere. So it, it's a really good feeling when you're teaching that lesson and someone can say, oh my gosh, I can do this now because you helped me and they feel more confident in it. Wow. Rebecca, what do you think? Are we? We've got a lot of great notes. This has been great. I think we should send stickers to everybody for being the, the warriors who lasted the piece of candy. I'll send you all a piece of candy and some money. Oh, it's your birthday, Donna. I prefer you sing to me, Donna, actually. <laughs> I was going to say, awesome. I feel like you should sing. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> this is very fun. Thank you all. It was really a oh, wonderful okay. evening. Thank you. Yeah. Do this again sometime. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everybody. No, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take care. You. Happy birthday, Donna. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo. Oh, hola. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> How do I say it right? Mahalo. I'm Oh, hello to you. Thank I know maybe Amy can, I don't know if Amy still there. There's a way to say happy birthday, but. <laughs> Bye. Say Mele Kingaliki Maka for Merry Christmas.